Um, I'm sure there might be some more technical difficulties as we go, as always, um, in the world of Zoom. So um, thanks for bearing with us. So our uh, first speaker, as Thomas mentioned, this is a pan BRC event and we have speakers representing all of the three BRCs. So Dr. Peter Thomas come, is at Moorfields uh, Eye Hospital and the BRC there, where he's the Director of Digital Innovation as well as a consultant ophthalmologist. And he's going to start us off with the first talk. Thank you very much, Peter. Very good, thank you very much. I will try and share my screen. Let's see if this works. Give me a shout if it's not working. So hopefully you're seeing all my slides. Uh, Emily, shake your head if you can't see them, but otherwise it looks like excellent. That's that's great. Um, so yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, I'm Peter Thomas. I'm, uh, I, I sort of approach this primarily from the clinical informatics side. I, I do some research informatics work and some AI work, but pretty small fry compared to uh, some of my colleagues at Moorfields like Pierce, so main, uh, Pierce Keen there, so I'm uh, mainly on the clinical informatics side of the spectrum. Um, all of this digital, in, digital transformation um, and AI work for us has a sort of particular need, so we're, we're about five years away we hope from moving to a brand new hospital uh, which will be out the back of St Pancras Station. It'll be an integrated facility, sort of clinical training, education, research, all under all under one very fancy roof, um, but it will bring with it um, problems we face in the current uh, hospital, which is that we simply won't be able to keep up with the amount of demand we have from an aging population with more chronic eye problems um, if we carry on providing care using the current systems that we are. And the solution for that is going to be a big move towards shared care with optometry, um, a big uh, move towards remote care, and trying to automate some aspects of care um, with, with data-driven approaches and, and particularly with AI. Um, this is sort of a sort of a slide I put together for a talk a couple of weeks ago that sort of basic types of clinical interaction we engage with divided down in, in person versus remote. Um, and this is how we were sort of pre COVID uh, doing an awful lot of in person work so via traditional clinics and via virtual clinics which for ours is where a patient comes in. Um, has various things measured about their eyes. So uh, an OCT scan, that's optical coherence tomography scan at the back of the eye, a photograph at the back of the eye, intraocular pressures taken, and it's reviewed by a clinician at some point later. Um, we did a little bit of care remotely. Um, primarily that was via shared care with optometry practices um, with whom ophthalmologists have always worked uh, to some extent. Um, but we did very little in terms of video consultation. So as far as I'm aware, we'd never done on a video consultation in earnest uh, on the NHS side prior uh, to the COVID outbreak. We weren't really doing much by way of home monitoring or telephone care and, and just that sort of low level um, extra shared care with optometrists. Um, that's changed quite a lot over the last six months for us. Uh, we're now one of the larger providers of video consultations in the NHS, um, about 16,000 we've provided now. Um, we've scaled up some of our home monitoring solutions. So we're now approaching, I think, probably moving towards about 1,000 patients who are monitoring their vision at home on our macular degeneration and diabetic maculopathy pathways. Um, in, in collaboration with um, uh, organisations like NHSX, we're working uh, on frameworks to significantly increase how we can share care with optometry. So we, we've seen a pretty big transformation over the past six months in terms of the sort of digital first uh, provision of care. And we can sort of try and try and look forwards as to what technologies we need, what capabilities we need in the hospital um, to do, you know, sort of a, a much more futuristic model of care. And there for us, we can imagine a patient rather than being referred into hospital, um, they would instead go to see their local optometrist who would collect a lot of data about them, their history, their examination, uh, images of the back of the eye. And then rather than referring that patient in, they would then upload that data onto a cloud-based platform. Um, we, we have a pilot uh, that does exactly that, running with a chain of optometrists down in our, around our Croydon Centre. And then rather than a human, as currently happens, reviewing that data, we would want to try and automate some of that analysis. And I'll show you an example in a few slides to time of some work that my colleagues have done uh, on automated analysis of OCT scans from optometry. And there's no reason, I mean, the, the data, a small, data, small structured data set together with an image lets you actually form very reliable diagnoses and management plans for a lot of patients. There's no reason for us not to automate the generation of those you know, presuming uh, appropriate sort of medical device um, certification. Uh, there's no reason for that not to be automated, or if it's more complex for that data to be passed over to a clinician to analyze who can form the management plan. Um, 
And then instead of having a human um, face-to-face -face consultation or just a letter, um, we could use AI powered virtual assistants. We, we've got one up and running to talk to the public about our new hospital move. And we've got various other ones in development behind the scenes. Um, we could allow that to have a conversation with the patient. And if that's insufficient, we can join the patient and the clinician up by video consultation. So when I was taking up my digital role a couple of years ago, these were sort of the technologies that I wanted to see fleshed out. And pretty much every box on that we have either in scaled form or in pilot form. And it's a matter of bringing them all together for us to really move forwards with sort of new digital driven models of care. Um, and that in the dash line would be a fully automated care pathway. Um, so for us to translate, AI and other technologies into clinic, um, we, we sort of have five real requirements and I've sort of color coded them as to where we are in terms of how mature we're getting. And maybe some of the green is a little bit over optimistic, but it just means we're relatively more mature in that side. Um, we need research activity to generate capabilities, assuming there's nothing on the market that we can just buy in. Uh, we need to validate and do the implementation science around those capabilities. We need a digital innovation units to support a rollout for it. We need digitally mature hospital informatics systems so that the data for this, let's say, for an AI system that automatically analyzes clinical data, so the data is available in the right structure and in the right place. And then long term, well, this is issues we're getting to now as we've scaled to large numbers, for example, the video consultation, we need to start thinking about how we support those um, services long term to make them sustainable. Um, in terms of certain more fields, in terms of research activities, there's, there's increasing focus in the BRC on informatics, informatics and AI research themes. Um, for example, Pierce Keen's lab has been extremely active in this, and there's uh, several other uh, researchers who are doing significant amounts of AI-based work. Uh, we now co-host the Insight uh, Hub, that's the HDR UK Data Research Hub for Ophthalmology. That's a shared award led with, led with Birmingham. Um, we're embedding AI activity, research activity across a number of groups, um, and there's been quite a lot of quite promising industry collaboration going on, the most prominent being that collaboration with Google and DeepMind, and I think that's coming up in one slide time. Uh, but for example, we've also run a re recent significant award in collaboration with a, country called, a company called DemDX, um, an NHS X AI award to do AI-enabled triage of patients building their, building their current product up. Uh, into something more clinically useful for us. Um, this has been the most high profile output. So this is uh, Pierce Keen and colleagues uh, from Google and from Moorfields uh, doing analysis of OCT scans of, um, of a macula. I'm actually getting a bit sick of showing the slide now, but it's, uh, it's, it's had very high impact. Um, and, and what this achieved was uh, human expert level performance in diagnosis uh, and determining what urgency of referral was needed uh, from OCT scans. Um, and while that may seem like a niche application uh, to people in other areas uh, of medicine, um, to put it into context, uh, one of these diseases would be wet macular degeneration and the NHS spends 500 million pounds per year treating that one disease alone. So making that treatment more efficient, uh, only getting patients onto the pathway who need it and getting those patients as quickly as possible uh, potentially has huge impacts in terms of uh, in terms of funding and in terms of uh, patient experience uh, in, in our clinics. Um, validation and implementation science. So we have the Moorfields Reading Centre. Um, that traditionally has focused on the clinical reading of diabetic retinopathy images, for example. Um, that was taken over by uh, my colleague Konstantinos Velaskas a couple of years ago, uh, with an increasing focus on implementation science and validation studies. Um, so for example, there is one recent large award he's won, uh, which is precisely about taking that OCT analysis um, AI software and taking the cloud-based platform that we uh, used to connect up to optometry practices and actually then running the trials to compare that uh, to current practice. Um, so that's an increasing area of focus uh, in that unit and, and, and others within more fields. Um, we're doing pretty well now on uh, digital innovation and supporting rollout of new technology. So um, uh, my colleague Dawn Sim, our director of telemedicine, and I set up a digital clinical lab uh, a couple of years ago. And, and the purpose of that, well, about a year ago, the purpose of that was to rapid, massively speed up 
um, our piloting uh, of new technologies. Uh, and we've had some pretty good success already of that. So we led the recent video consultation uh, rollout, for example. Uh, that's now the fourth largest uh, in the UK, use, uh, in England, using the national platform. And I think our accident and emergency department is the busiest single service uh, on the national platform. Uh, we also have active projects going on in that unit uh, on virtual assistance. Uh, home vision monitoring, so we're into the many hundreds of patients who are monitoring their vision at home, and uh, shared care with optometry, as I mentioned. Uh, in terms of digital maturity of our informatics systems, now it's great to have all these different technologies, but you can only use the data if it's being stored in a way that's structured and is accessible um, to other bits of software that can make decisions with it, that can draw it together, uh, that can you know, analyze progress of, let's say, a glaucoma patient between data that's collected at home, in clinic, and in optometry practice. Um, I, I colored that in yellow because historically, I, I don't think we've uh, been outstanding on that front. Um, we do have an electronic medical record refresh underway, upgrading to a system called Open Eyes. Um, that is an open source uh, ophthalmology only electronic medical record system. It was, development of that was originally started in Moorfields years ago. Uh, that's now um, run by something called the Open Eyes Foundation, part of Aperta. Um, and that's been deployed as the national EMR for eye care in Scotland and in Wales and in an increasing number of trusts in England. Uh, and we'll be upgrading to that, uh, that newest edition. That'll give us something that's you know, we're quite in quite a fortunate position. We don't have to worry about 20 different clinical specialties uh, or 30 different clinical specialties. We just have ophthalmology. And although we make a great play about different subspecialties within ophthalmology, um, the number of data structures we, we need within that system to structure our data, uh, um, to make it interoperable with other systems, it's a very small challenge really compared to other hospitals that are dealing with lots and lots of different specialties all with their own requirements. Uh, because it's open source and because we're represented on the design authority, that gives us greater flexibility to ensure that um, the clinical data is being captured in a way that's gonna be useful for our informatics work, that it's well-structured, that it's consistent and that it's clean. Um, and the nice thing about that platform as well is that it's, it's really clinician oriented. So um, there's a huge amount of work that goes into click minimization. Um, I don't know how, how Epic is these days. Um, I used to use it when I was up at Addenbrooke's and it had some really good features on it, but um, it did tend to encourage people to seek workarounds in terms of data entry um, because of the sheer number of clicks. So perhaps not all data was always being entered in a fully structured way. And that's one of the benefits we get because we have this slightly easier problem uh, in terms of we can get an EMR that's, that's ophthalmology specific and doesn't have to fulfill so many different roles. Um, I think where we're sort of identifying now the sort of clinical informatics gap uh, will be what we do longer term. So, you know, what we do when we're successful. So we know that we can develop new approaches. We know that we can validate them and implement them and pilot them. And we've shown we can scale them as well. Um, but the question we're now facing, and we've hit that first, I'd say, with video consultations, we're going to hit it next with home monitoring of vision as that spreads to more diseases and more um, specialties. What about when we get to 100,000 patients who we are managing digitally on a number of different pathways? Now, the innovation unit we have can't support that kind of volume. And traditional clinical services probably don't have the skills needed for it, especially when you bring in AI and automated decision making. Um, now, that gets some uncomfortable questions. So if we have lots of different systems gathering patient data from lots of different places, how do we make sure that all of that data is actioned? Do we need to draw up hundreds of different duty rosters so that a fellow who works in a particular medical retina clinic is responsible for checking on Thursdays that uh, all the data that's coming on a, on a given system. Um, how do we make sure that each clinical service is using every platform they're using optimally? There's going to be huge training requirements for that. And actually, we're going to have to have huge training requirements for the patients as well. How are we going to monitor the clinical safety of that many digital services? And that's going to become particularly problematic when they replace entirely the, in, the traditional services, because then what's our comparator going to be? And how, who's going to actually understand whether the AI is doing well when it starts to make clinical decisions? That's going to need a lot of skills to monitor it, to do the governance, to make sure that we're using that, you know, as it develops, its performance is being maintained for all groups of patients. And probably we can't expect the individual clinical services and clinicians to have each to have that degree of skill um, to sustain their services at volume. 
So it, it's not the first time this question has come up. Uh, there was a nice paper in the BMJ uh, Health and Care Informatics um, arguing for the need of a Department of Clinical Artificial Intelligence and making what I think is quite a nice analogy uh, to a radiology department, which is that you know, radiology rapidly got to a level of complexity that it was no longer accessible to uh, your average hospital technician or your average clinician. So radiology departments had to build up to handle these very complex pieces of technology to understand the protocols, run the pathways, do the clinical interpretation, uh, even just to buy and install a new machine uh, obviously requires a huge amount of skill. And um, while I take the arguments about a department for clinical AI, I think the need is actually much broader. And I'm beginning to wonder if what hospitals need is uh, instead of just something that focuses on AI, um, some central support um, for digital medicine in general. Um, now I've written on this slide a few things that could do, but broadly speaking, it would be in, in concepts similar to this radiology analogy, but wherein um, a clinician who is running traditional services, who wants to provide digital care for their patients, um, is able to refer those patients to run on a defined pathway that's run by some central department within the hospital that is just really, really good at doing digital medicine. Um, so you begin to build a central unit within the hospital that really understands governance, that really understands how to monitor the safety of these systems. And I'm not talking about sort of a parallel IT department. This in the way that radiology is, um, I think would have to be a clinical department staffed with a lot more clinical informaticians of which there are far too few at the moment. Um, so that's where I sort of want to leave it. And I'm particularly keen to hear other people's thoughts really on that, um, uh, particularly on how they think they're gonna sustain um, these very large digital services, particularly with AI. Um, whether I think there's any merit in that idea, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Um, I guess one of the first questions that came up on uh, Slido and potentially you may have answered it in one of your first slides where you were able to pinpoint a whole system that uh, went through fully automated. So the question was, are we close to AI performing better than human clinicians? Um, I think we've been at that point for a very long time. You can look back to the 1970s with systems like Mycin, which is sort of a, um, a knowledge base sort of expert system um, that was able to take in various bits of clinical information, I think make clinical decisions around, around septicemia, I think it was. Um, that outperformed individual clinicians. The problem has been outperforming clinicians in a task that's clinically useful in the real world. Uh, and that's where these systems have lagged behind. They've always been able to do useful things, but those, well, they've always been able to sort of, you know, outperform people on individual tasks, but the challenge has been actually doing something useful as well. And that's where we're beginning to see it come in. And uh, the, the example I showed of that, uh, of that analysis of the OCT scan, I mean, that's quite a useful capability to have in hospital, to have an automated diagnosis from an OCT scan. But the hospital is also the place that's full of ophthalmologists who spend a lot of time looking at OCT scans who could glance at the screen and most of the time get the same diagnosis. Where it becomes really useful is where you're able to put that capability where the decision couldn't already be made. And that, for example, might be in an optometry practice. So you need then the clinical pathways where that can be embedded in an optometry practice. And you need the digital maturity to hook that up to the hospital so that something can be done with the output. So I think that outperforming humans has been done by computers in clinical tasks for a long time. What hasn't quite happened yet, uh, and is just beginning to happen, certainly with AI and deep learning, probably with more conventional technologies earlier than that, um, is that it's doing useful tasks as well that are worth changing your pathways for. Okay, that's great. And um, I guess this one's just come up as well in response to your talk. So the question is, how are we to control the quality of unstructured subjective data that is fed into the AI system? Uh, it's often left to the most junior members of a team potentially. And you've added the acronym I've never seen before. Guy go, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> Is this um, a, a, an issue that your team has been working on? Or? Yeah, so I mean, we see, you know, there's a lot of hospitals that don't still have, you know, good EMR uptake, and there's a lot of hospitals 
tools where the EMR isn't really much more than just an electronic piece of paper, um, you know, where it may have fields for you to enter pieces of data, but those fields, you may not be able to do much with them because they're not defined according to, you know, they're not SNOMED coded, for example, to allow interoperability. Um, I think this is where the sort of clinical informatics side of things has to kick in. Uh, we've got to make sure that the EMR systems we deploy are easy to use, that people don't just work around structured data entry. Um, so they don't, you know, they put the blood pressure in the blood pressure field rather than typing it free text in their comment, for example. And that a lot of that's to do with good design of an electronic medical record system. When you have a system that's really click heavy, that takes you a long time to just even close a consultation, you'll find that people will ignore structured data entry wherever possible and just do that one field in the comment. Um, a lot of our historic data at Moorfields looks like that. We're very good on electronic letters. We're probably less good on historical structured clinical data, um, but that should improve as we as we upgrade our EMR in the near future. Um, so I think we need to try and try and make it um, easy to enter high quality structured data by whoever's entering it and avoid this this need to sort of bootstrap ourselves you know a lot of people do nlp on clinical letters to try and extract the structured clinical data from historical data sets that's great um, but much better would be if that data was structured in the first place and a lot of that is around uh, emr design and making sure that uh, clinicians are trained to use emrs properly sorry um can you hear me it was my question i just want to come back slightly on that um it's Alex Brown, I'm, I'm a pediatric trainee. Um, I, my question wasn't so much about structured versus unstructured data. I actually find the opposite that uh, well, so-called well-designed DMR systems with heavily structured data, ST1s don't know what a SNOMED code is. And it's often left to those members of the team, oh, can you fill in this patient's record? And, and what's put in is rubbish. So my, my problem is actually more with the heavily structured formats rather than with the unstructured formats. Gotcha. So I think that's a training issue, isn't it? So I think we touched on the introductory part there that, uh, you know, clinical informatics, the, the concept of a clinical informatician as a medical specialty um, it is a relatively new one. Uh, I, I was in medical school not that long ago, only about, only about 12 years ago. Um, and then there was, there was nothing around informatics training. How much that's changed, I, I don't actually know. Maybe, maybe someone else is better able to comment on that. But um, I think that uh, that does need to become a part of medical training and, and probably we will see clinical informatician becoming a medical specialty at some point and, and delivering that training. Great, and I can see there's a good conversation currently going on in the chat that yes, as clinical informatics will, um, I guess as the training changes, it, medical training will adapt as well, won't it? To, um, adapt to these new ways of working. For, I guess, a lot of hospitals, the paper-free system is quite new. I know for, gosh, in UCLH, we've, they've only just celebrated their one-year anniversary of um, nearly being paper-free. So it is um, definitely a new field uh, where the medical education may not have changed yet to adapt to that. Um, Great. So we'll go one last question, if you have time, Peter. So um, again, from Slido, in the longer term, how will people fit into the AI pathway? So I guess this refers to um, where the clinicians and, and potentially patients come in and how do we maintain those clinical expertise and engagement? So, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a really broad question. Um, so uh, in that there's probably loads and loads of different ways to answer it. I mean, my typical answer is that, you know, technology has always changed things. And I'm sure that the way neurologists practice now um, is probably different to how they practice before the advent of sort of fancy MRI scanners. Uh, I certainly know that when I examine a patient's macula, um, so the central part of their retina on, on their microscopes, which we call slit lamps, I extract much less information from that examination than a colleague of mine who trained 30 years ago would have done um, because if I think something looks wrong I get them on the OCT scanner um, and I get a lot of information from that so uh, yeah I mean I think some that there may be some issues where uh, where we are de-skilled but as long as the tools that that support that de-skilling are universally available then that doesn't have to be an issue and it's not anything fundamentally new it's, it's a new tool in the arsenal and provided we make sure it works well just as we make sure mri scanners work well just as we make sure oct scanners work well we don't have to regard that as something lost it's just something new we rely on like we rely on dozens of other tools and technologies uh, to do our jobs 
Great. Thank you so much. 